Hi, good afternoon. So I made a video a few about a month ago about methadrone because uh, it had been linked to a few deaths here in the UK. And since I made that video, methadrone has been banned by the UK government. And it's been an interesting time. There's been quite a lot of comments on my methadrone video, and I've learned quite a lot by doing it. And one of the comments that was posted was simply a troll from a sort of legal high drugs company advertising methadrone replacements. And one of the ones they advertised was NRG1. And so I thought I'd take a look into this drug and what it actually was. There was a piece in The Sun a couple of weeks ago talking about NRG1 and saying that it's really a very dangerous drug. And it was written in terms of hyperbole that you'd kind of expect from The Sun newspaper. But I wondered if the chemistry behind the piece in The Sun actually stacked up and what chemically NRG1 was how it was related to some of the other drugs that have caused problems, and what potential problems may be associated with this new legal high, which is available at very low cost. So chemically, NRG1 is actually naphthorone. And what you'll see is that it's related quite closely to a drug like methadrone. If we look at the structures side by side, you can see that both have an aromatic ring and a ketone. Both contain a nitrogen on the right-hand side of the molecule. In one case, the nitrogen has a methyl group on it. In the case of nafarone, it has a ring connecting around, so it's a tertiary nitrogen atom. You'll also notice that between the ketone and the amine group is a side chain hanging off the molecule. In the case of methadrone, it's methyl, and in the case of nafarone, it's a propyl. So what might we expect the differences in structure between nafarone and methadrone to have on the activity of those compounds. And what is actually known about the chemistry and pharmacology of nafarone? Well, first of all, it has to be said that there is no safety or toxicity data about nafarone. It's never been used in people at all. It was first identified in a scientific paper back in 2006, when it was noted to be a particularly potent inhibitor of some important enzymes within the body. The enzymes that it inhibited were the serotonin transporter, the dopamine transporter, and the norepinephrine transporter. Each of those compounds, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, are associated with mood within the brain. And if you have high levels of those amine-like compounds within your brain, you have high mood, euphoria, and so on. This is how many of this class of drug works. They mimic the structure of those amines. They interact with similar targets within your body, and therefore a drug such as this or any of the other amphetamines or cathinones behaves a little bit like something like serotonin in your brain, giving you that boost. It was reported that nafarone was active at incredibly low dose, down to nanomolar levels. So you'd need very small amounts of this to have some sort of effect. But you have to remember that these studies were just done in a test tube. They weren't done in an animal model. They weren't done in a human model. So although it's known that the drug is active on the transporter in a test tube, there is no understanding of how it interacts with the rest of your body, or what the side effects might be, or what the long-term effects might be. And so, although technically this is a legal high, there is very little known about the drug itself. One of the things that is known about nafarone, or NRG1, is that it's active at very low doses, and that is a problem. Particularly if you've been taking methadrone and you view this drug as a substitute, and you take a similar dose of this to what you took of methadrone, you could be in serious trouble. And there have been hospitalizations from people taking overdoses and high doses of nafarone as a drug. One of the things that worries me most looking at the structure of nafarone is the naphthalene ring. It's something that pharmaceutical chemists don't use very often and we don't like to see it on drugs and there's a good reason why we're not happy with that chemical structure. Take a look here at the structure of another potential drug that was developed with a naphthalene ring. This was pronethalol. This was going to be a beta blocker. And it got into animal trials, and the problem was it was shown to have significant carcinogenicity, i.e. it caused cancer, in mice. Compare the structure of pronethalol with nafarone. They're actually relatively similar. They both have an aphthalene ring, an oxygen functionality adjacent, and a nitrogen atom three positions away from the aromatic ring. The mechanism of carcinogenicity of pronethalol 
was believed to be because of epoxidation of the naphthalene ring. This is a standard metabolic reaction within your body. What your body does when you take a drug is it tries to convert it into a form whereby your body can get rid of the drug. This is how you deal with everything you eat and anything that you take in. Your body wants to metabolize it so that you can deal with it and excrete it. And when you have an aphthalene ring on a molecule, you can do a reaction called epoxidation to make a structure like the one you're looking at here. If you look at the epoxide ring that forms, it's highly strained. It has 60 degree bond angles. That's why it's so reactive. And the carbons attached to the oxygen are highly delta positive. So any source of electrons can come in and open that epoxide ring. And the kinds of things within your body that might do that are key proteins or DNA itself. And this is what can lead to cancer. If you open epoxides with things like DNA or vital proteins, the cells can turn cancerous. And this is why naphthalene compounds would typically often be avoided in the drug development process. And it must be a worry about nafarone that it could be carcinogenic. To be honest, it kind of surprises me that nafarone appears to have avoided the general ban on cathinone type drugs that the government put in place. The structural differences are relatively small between this and mephedrone. And actually, I'd say the structural differences would make this a significantly higher risk as a drug than mephedrone itself. And yet this drug remains legal as currently, and I would expect or anticipate that the government will probably act on this drug in the relatively near future. So if it was me, this one, no, no, I wouldn't take this one. I wouldn't take nafarone. I think the long-term risks are too unknown. I think just from looking at the structure, I would be significantly worried about carcinogenicity. Note that that's the kind of thing that can't be picked up for 10, 20 years after taking large quantities of a substance. So it's not something that's going to show up in the next three months, the next six months, the next year. And it may be something where you take relatively small amounts of the drug over a period of time and 20 years down the line, you suffer the consequence of that. That naphthalene ring alone is enough of a risk in my point of view that personally, I wouldn't go near this drug. Still alive.